My name is David Josky. I'm a clinical haematologist at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital in Perth. Um, I trained in Perth and spent some time, four years in Europe, looking at uh, research into viruses causing Hodgkin lymphoma and working on the bone marrow transplant unit at the Hammersmith Hospital in London. And then I was appointed as a consultant haematologist in the head of department at my hospital in 1994, uh, where I'm still working to this day. And as a, a young consultant um, in the 90s, I formed the conclusion that really we were making a bit of a meal of this business of managing people with cancer. And I witnessed a lot of distress with delays in appointments and poor communication. Uh, my colleagues, particularly medical, but also nursing, with less and less time that we were able to spend with our patients to express that we cared for them, um, which tended to give people this feeling they're on a production line. Um, and I just felt like there must be better ways of achieving this. And in fact, I've pretty much dedicated my professional life since then to trying to find ways to improve the cancer journey for Australians, particularly with blood cancers. And in, uh, in the talk that I usually give on this, I kind of do a mini ward round where I talk about vignettes and stories from people whose care I've been involved in and let them tell the story because people often tell it much better than I do. Um, but it was a chance comment from one of my patients in 1998, a guy called Roy that was getting chemotherapy for lymphoma, um, that led me to see that a lot of my patients were trying complementary and alternative therapies, felt that they couldn't discuss it with the medical team and for me, this was not acceptable. It created a barrier between myself and my patients such that uh, we weren't quite rowing in the same direction. And so I felt like I had to become a doctor who showed an open mind on this. And then I started reading up on uh, what was an area of medicine that was rejected by mainstream medicine and started finding more evidence than I expected in favor of complementary therapies rather than complementary medicines. Long story short, a chance came to create a cancer support centre in my hospital through a benefactor, and we established the first cancer support centre and opened on September the 15th in 2001. And the idea was to have a centre that functioned on three levels. Firstly, just a quiet place. People come in, have a cup of tea. We made a little kitchen area like an Australian home and had um, meet and greet volunteers from all walks of life who just wanted to help Second level of functioning for our centre was to provide people with good information and to triage them to support services, be it the Leukaemia Foundation, the Cancer Council, the Breast Foundation, whatever. Um, and the third and most controversial level of the centre was to offer cancer patients access to a variety of safe and supervised complementary therapies. Uh, and again, this was things that mainstream medicine had rejected for uh, tens if not hundreds of years, um, including acupuncture, yoga, music therapy, massage, uh, aromatherapy, reflexology, qigong, craniosacral massage, um, and most controversially, some hands-off massage techniques such as Reiki and pranic healing. We not only decided to offer these to patients, but to try and measure the effects because there was a lot of pushback, there was a lot of scepticism, and I felt that the best answer to this was to collect evidence in support of it, because generally I find even the most skeptical mainstream practitioners will respond to good quality evidence if you can collect it. The first centre then opened on September the 15th in 2001, and from that day to this, we've had about 100 to 150 people a week coming into the centre at my hospital. And this reflected a huge demand for people for good information and advice about this. And as I've um, matured, I guess, as a consultant with the grey hair, um, I've come to see this topic as what I call the lifestyle management of your cancer if you have a blood cancer. And so I will talk to people under my care with uh, a very open mind about what they want to try. I'll look up stuff in books on herbs and supplements. Generally, I think they're best avoided during mainstream treatment. 
and we'll talk about things like diet and stress, crucially exercise, terribly important, um, how to manage the reaction of people around you because some people can't handle this news. A diagnosis of cancer is very polarising and I warn people of this. Um, I suggest for a lot of patients that they appoint a spokesperson outside the household who can do all the talking for them, which makes it possible not to have to be on the phone all day talking to well-meaning relatives and friends about your cancer. Um, and the centre at Charlie's just kind of was getting bigger and bigger and bigger and the research was gaining ahead of steam. Such that four or five years later, we decided we could see we needed to form a foundation. And it's fair to say I had a bit of a personal crisis at this point. I could see that this was all going to be a big deal and a lot of people were investing their hope in me. And in the end, I decided, I came back to the moral compass, which said, all of the feedback on this from your patients is good. It's the right thing to do. Just do it. And if people choose to follow, that's their choice. And so we committed, formed the Solaris, uh, originally the Solaris Foundation in 2006, formal opening. And this has morphed into Solaris Cancer Care with uh, centres in other hospitals in Perth and in rural and regional Western Australia. And now we've merged with other cancer charities with something called the Cancer Support Association. Um, and we have an off-health campus um, facility, which is the focus of what we call our survivorship initiatives. So we need to think about what's going on here. What we are doing is taking lay community, I call them healers, people who want to help, and drawing on a wellspring of goodwill and support from the community for people who want to help people with cancer and transforming that into a very literally tangible palpable um, means of support. And so it's part of, I think, a way of rehumanizing cancer care where we not only give patients access to the very best of the fantastic new developments in haematology, and it's been an incredible time to be a haematologist with so many brilliant new drugs in development, not chemotherapy, much more patient friendly. But all of that science stuff is well and good. Um, yes, we're going to improve cure rates and yes, we're going to improve remission rates. But there's always going to be that personal experience, the worst day of your life, as somebody called it, where you're told you have a cancer and everything changes and you have to get your head around that and then come up with how you're going to manage your situation. So probably the most important pieces of advice I would give people under my care is, firstly, learn about and understand what the medical plan is, why it's been recommended, what's hoped to be achieved, what's involved in getting it, short term and long term. And I regard chemotherapy, which is still the main, main part of most people's initial treatment, as an investment. It's like taking out a bank loan. And um, you make the investment in terms of the short term cost of side effects and feeling crappy and drips and blood tests and visits to hospital, but the return on the investment can be life itself. And so the short-term impost on the immune system is well worth it in the longer term. So number one, understand the medical plan. Then I'd say you need to come up with your own plan as to how you're going to manage your cancer. And this is horses for courses. There's no single best prescription for this. It's very much about what's the right way for me to wake up in the morning, get hit again by the realisation I've got this diagnosis and this treatment, and then say, ah, but here's the mainstream cancer plan, I understand that, and this is my plan to help me deal with it, whether it's meditation, um, complementary therapies, looking up screeds of stuff on the internet or not looking up screeds of stuff on the internet, you have the right to manage your cancer the way that's best for you. A lot of people diagnosed with blood cancers are told you must be positive, you're going to beat this, and it's a very destructive notion in my view. There's no evidence that coping styles improve cancer outcomes. There's plenty of evidence that if you have a more hopeful point of view, the cancer journey is easier to bear. And that's really 
for me, it's much more important rather than this be positive thing, which makes a lot of cancer patients feel guilty because they feel too crappy to be positive. I think it's more important to reach a point where you can be calm about the diagnosis. And again, this gets back to understanding the medical plan and having your own plan to manage the situation. If you're somebody with a blood cancer, the most important thing you can do, I believe, is exercise to help yourself. In the bad old days, we used to tell people who were feeling tired during cancer treatment to rest. Turns out that was not good advice. Uh, then we went through a phase of telling people go for walks. Turns out that doesn't cut the mustard either. What's needed is um, some resistance type exercise as well, because cancer drugs and steroids, prednisolone, dexamethasone, tend to dissolve muscle. And the only way to get muscle back or to keep it is to use it. And I've had patients three or four years out from their chemotherapy who still feel exhausted. Then you give them the right exercise prescription with some light weights and a gym program. And within four or six weeks, they're starting to feel like their old selves again. We now know that to do exercise during cancer treatment is safe and also beneficial. Um, there are probably other effects in terms of if you do it with a community, that's important and uh, possibly benefits for the immune system as well. So um, my personal belief in all of this is that if we look at the last 30, 40 years of cancer medicine as a kind of broad helicopter view, fantastic work on the science, brilliant new drugs, great new breakthroughs. In my professional lifetime, we've effectively cured or controlled CML with no risk treatments. We've tripled the lifespan for multiple myeloma. We've greatly improved the prognosis for many sorts of lymphoma. Um, but I'm worried that our system is so focused on the science that we're losing the humanity. And we must find ways to create uh, time for people to talk about their cancer with their health professionals and with others, and to have access to other ways to help make the cancer journey um, more bearable.